Um, if you wrote negative 5 times negative 5, you didn't get the, what the guy in the video called the standard answer. And I wouldn't say that it's because you did it wrong. I would say it was just because you're forgetting about the order that we all agreed to. Okay. okay. Uh, what we should get, the standard answer would be, following the agreed upon order, would be negative 5 times 5, right? The negative result of 5 times 5. Take 5 times 5, and whatever that is, slap a negative 5. Okay. Um, let me put this to you. If, instead of this being written, there was this, do you think that there would be less of this? Less of this? Okay. Everybody feel like you would get this instead of that if there were parentheses around the five squared. Yeah, I don't know. Not sure. Well, I do. I think I would. Well, well, then let's think about it this way. Yeah, I, yeah, I would. If I wanted it to be, if I wanted it to come out as this, would somebody come up and write something that would? you feel like it would just have to guarantee that someone would write it this way and they wouldn't make any mistakes, right? I'm just gonna write something you think. Absolutely get negative five times negative five and no arguments. What do you guys think? Yeah, Thank you. yeah that, that one is very clear. Raising it up to the second power means multiply this number by itself. The parentheses around negative five make it clear that I want negative five times negative five, right? I think. It just would be worldwide very little argument if we just put this to the internet, right? We said, what is this? Okay. I also think maybe there'd be a little bit more mistakes made on this, but I think it's pretty clear, right? In parentheses, I, I'm putting walls around this thing saying, take something and multiply it by itself. Can you tell what that thing is that you're supposed to multiply by itself? Just the number five, right? That's it. And then, you know what? After you're done with that, there's a negative outside there waiting to be multiplied by answer, the result. Now the thing about it is this has this, uh, this though we don't see this written, it has what the guy in, uh, in the video pointed out were these implied parentheses. They're not written down, but because we have this order of operations that we, we do agree to, it's, it's implied they're still there. They're still telling me, take five, the number five. That's the one I want you to multiply by itself. That's first. Then we're going to take the negative, right? Anybody tell us like what is it about the order of operations that we agree to? It's not, not about right and wrong, but it is about we agree to this. What is it about that order of operations? It does tell me that those applied parentheses are there. Exponents before multiplication. Exponents before multiplication. What do you mean multiplication? I don't see any multiplication. Well, negative one times five squared is right. what this. So it could be written. So there, I mean, it can seem a little annoying. There's this implied parentheses here. There's this implied multiplication by negative one. Okay. But, If we were to write it all out, removing all of the impliedness of it, we would write it like that. Okay. But with the order of operations, we know that exponents come before multiplication, and when you have a negative out there, that means negative one times. Whatever that negative. Uh, stop me if I shouldn't move past that, but I think we're cool on that. 23 is next, correct? Not correct, let me know. Fourth. That's cute. We're going to evaluate it for x equals negative 1, means we're going to plug in negative 1 for x. Okay. What is x? Don't tell me negative 1. What is x? Like conceptually, what is x? Unknown. An unknown value, right? x stands in the place of a number. It's supposed to have stuff done to it, right? 
stuff is supposed to happen to this number x is standing in its place until that number shows up. And this is just like that. Okay? So negative one is supposed to come in here and have all the things done to it that x is having done to it, right? Something that's really going to help, help you not make as many mistakes when you're substituting, especially with negatives, is if we use those parentheses, right? Let's forget about the implied parentheses. Let's actually put the parentheses there. So what we have is two times some number that's raised to the fourth power. Right? Now the parentheses make it more clear, like something goes in here and then plugs something into that spot. Right? Now here we have negative, or, yeah, negative four times something that's raised to the third power. Now what is that something? Negative one, right? That's what the, I guess you're trying to do books open. Yeah, it's negative one. It says to evaluate it for x equals negative one. When I have those parentheses there, it makes it harder for me to make mistakes, particularly with negative numbers. Okay. Um, so I look at the negative one. What should I, should I multiply by two? Or should I raise it to the fourth power? Which one is it? Exponents come first, per the agreement. So two times negative one, well, maybe you can do this in your head, but I'm just going to write it all out. Yes, four times. Well, we just uh, established this in the other term, so we'll just go ahead and do that again. Well, uh, these are together positive, right? And these are positive as well. So we just get a positive one times two, which is just two. And over here, these are positive, but then this guy, the standalone, is negative. So we have negative four times a negative one. So you have four, we get six. Right, so if we put the parentheses, just take x out and put parentheses there. It's not really a trick, it's, it's just, it is what x is. It is a blank spot where a number is supposed to go. And when you drop parentheses there, you're more likely to plug it into that place correctly and do the correct things to it in the correct order, or at least the agreed upon order. Okay, is that good, does that help? Good. Now on to, it looks like, 30. So there's a property that we're supposed to use that we drew a picture of, right, to, to display how this property works. What is that property called? The distributive, right? The distributive property is at play here. You guys remember the picture that we drew of the rectangle that showed you distribution? Why a number distributes across parentheses? Okay. So the 10 is supposed to distribute n squared in the n. So 10 times n squared is 10 n squared. 10 times n is 10 n. Okay. Now we have a negative 6 times the parentheses. Keep in mind, if I were to just kind of circle this thing and circle this thing, we have one thing, right, in this circle, this other thing, this other unit, this other term in this circle. What's happening between these two groups of things? What operation is happening between these two groups of things? I'm taking this group and I'm multiplying it by that group. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about the circles. Oh, no, I'm talking about like I got this circle here, this circle here, so I've kind of broken into two, like the whole thing is broken into two pieces. How are these two pieces <coughs> ready to put together? I'm taking one and raising it to the power of the other, and I'm adding them, and I'm multiplying them, dividing them, what's going on between the two? Uh, yeah, if I, maybe if I cut out the negative there, but really, since I'm including the negative in that circle, I would say run the addition. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because it's a really common thing to uh, get caught up in the distribution and then wind up multiplying these two groups together. Like once you figure out what each group is worth after you've distributed, it will wind up multiplying them together. Right? So be careful that you don't do that. Uh, it's, it's this thing, this number, plus this number. If this number comes out negative, we're going to be subtracting. If it comes out positive, we're going to be adding. Right? So we can just put 
that right away, plus this other stuff that comes out of this distribution. So we get negative 6 times n squared, we get minus 6n squared. Again, negative distributed to the second term as well. Not just the first one, but the second one as well. So we get a plus 12. So we get like terms, we get 10n squared minus 6n squared, that's 4n squared. We have 10 n, uh, that's, that's it. That's the only n term there is. Plus 12. How about this? You put 4 n squared plus 10 n is 14 n to the third. Is that going to work out? No. Do I ever see this? Yes. Yeah. I see it all the time. Well, so, shouldn't. shouldn't see it, but I do see it. I wish I never saw the things I shouldn't see. Uh, but I want to help you understand why um, this isn't so. So your brain will tell you that that makes sense. That goes together. Okay. Uh, for one thing, four of these, right? These things are different from these things. Just yeah. now, the base level an analogy. You can't put apples and oranges together. They're completely different things. Okay. What would be even better is if we understood why it is that they're different. Why is an n squared different from an n? Why can't I put these together and get, well, I'm just addressing the n squared in the end, right? Well, they, okay, they look different, all right? But I mean, 4n uh, plus 2n, that is 6n, right? Even though the 4 and the 2 look different, now they do go together, and they are 6. They're the same unknown. They're the same unknown, yeah. Yeah, this is like a 4 times some number, and this is 2 times the same number. It's exactly what it is. And if you were to take four times some number plus two times some number, you get six times that number, right? You're just shortening it up, all right? But that's not the case here. This is not the same number as that, so we can't just say 14 of some number plus 10 of the same number. It's not the same number. It's a completely different number, right? Also, if we think of them as more abstractly, they're just not the same thing. Let me make this point real quick. If I say this is n to the third, can someone just, I mean, purely on a, you know, operational, basis, like how is this kind of looks similar but not the same as this? What does n to the third mean? n times n times n. That's all it means. n times n times n. Over here, we have three n's, don't we? Don't the three n's exist over here on this side of the equation? Yeah. The non-equation, this is not equal. But the problem is, this is n times n. What needs to come next for it to be the same as this? Uh, times n, but it's plus n. The adding an n is completely different from multiplying by n. So there's another thing. Why they're not the same thing? Just one more, just like a, a picture. This is even something that we could hold on to. Like, just grab your stick over here. Okay. n to the first power. Think of as a thing in the first dimension, just one dimension, right? Like length. Length is one dimension. So if we think of n as, right, and this is not always what n is not always a length, right? Sometimes n is dollars, n is time, n could be anything, but it helps us to see it, and we could even touch it, we could build n and n squared. So if n is a length like this, let's just say some length, what would n squared, how could we? Build n squared, knowing that n is this. Draw a square. Draw a square. Okay, this side is n, this side is n. What we built here in the middle, the area of the square is n squared. So n is this length, n squared is this area. Completely different objects, right? Apples and oranges. We cannot put them together. How about n to the third? How can we <coughs> see we cross from one dimension to two dimensions, and then what? A cube. Right, we got this n times n, get this n squared on the face here. And give ourselves a third dimension, another n, and this whole volume thing is n cubed. Right, the whole thing is cubed inside. Now, this is a helpful picture up to n cubed. Because how would I do n to the fourth? Draw a fourth point to the left. Yeah, how do we do that? I'm 
not something on the cube. Yeah. <laughs> Drawing things and, and visualizing things beyond three dimensions is very difficult for the human mind to do. Right? So I can't keep showing you what these things look like, but I can show you for the first three dimensions. This is n, this is n squared, this is n to the third. We cannot add n to squared sense. plus n to the third. They're two different things, apples and oranges. Are, this is already apples. So this is oranges and bananas. You can't add them together. <laughs> right? Completely different. Well, two dimensions, three dimensions. Um, so they're literally in different dimensions, and uh, it'd be difficult to interact with something that's at a different dimension than you are, right? Yeah. What's going on for these guys? They are on different dimensions. It's hard for them to yeah. exist in the same place. You cannot put them together in the same dimension. All right. So that's that. Just making a point about like terms, really, right? That's all I'm talking about. I'm talking about like terms. Uh, and number 50. Same thing, but just do it real quick. Just a little bit more complex. Right, so we'll distribute 3, that's 3x three squared, minus 3y. Distribute this 9, remembering that this stuff is added to this stuff, right? there's no multiplication here, we're just adding whatever comes next. Plus 9x squared plus 18y. Uh, let's see, oh, this should have been a 3x squared. 3x okay. squared, 9x squared, those are the same kinds of things. We can put those together, 12 of those. 18y, uh, negative 3y, those are the same kinds of things. We can put those together, all together we get 15 of those. It takes care of everything. There's nothing else that doesn't pair up with another like term. It's all, it's got to be out of it, it's all good. Good. Are there any questions? More questions? Okay. Then, uh, what we're saying, if we have no questions, is uh, assess me on the, the stuff that we just had homework on, because I feel like I'm an expert. I feel like I can blow this thing out of the water, make no mistakes. Right? If that's the case, if you feel like an expert, then pass your homework. If you're on your homework, make sure you have a piece of it. Write an expression that represents this situation where uh, we're trying to find an area of some square. We just don't know how big that square is. We're going to call that side length S. So no matter what, if I put the side length into this expression, it will tell me the area. A equals S squared. A equals S squared. Even if you don't have A equals, you just have S squared, that's fine too, right? That's an expression. What you have here is equation. Okay? I'll make the I'll express the difference between these two things repeatedly throughout the year, but equation, cover this up right here, you just have an expression. That's an expression, that's an expression, put an equal sign, that's an equation. Yes? So just S squared is cool? S squared is cool. A, just A, is not cool. The reason why S squared is cool is because I said expression, expression, not equation, is not. Well, yeah. You do have the expression there, right? Both sides are an expression. An equation is just something that takes two expressions and says they're the same. Uh, so on either side of an equation, you'll always find an expression. All right, any questions? Sounds good, here we go. We're going to uh, simplify, which another uh, different kind of instructions could be collect like terms. Right? Collect like terms. We went into you know, almost ad nauseum to the point of making you sick. Uh, what like terms are and why not like terms are not like terms. Uh, I'm just going to start with the highest power, but if, if they have it in a different order, but all the terms are correct with the correct uh, signs on them, then it's fine, right? Because 2 plus 3, 3 plus 2, if I change the order, that doesn't matter. So I'll start with the highest power of 3. There's no other like terms with that. It's the only one in the third dimension, so it will stay alone. These are both on the second dimension, right? These could both represent areas or uh, seconds squared or something like that. So uh, we can put those together. We get negative two of those. And then I like cross them out as I collect. This is the only one in the first dimension, right? And 
here's the only constant around. Did I go too, go forward too quickly? Do I have any questions or anything? Okay. Alright. So we're gonna plug in negative two for x. Remember I said it's gonna be very helpful that would keep you from doing uh, anything mistakenly, particularly when the negative in there is to put parentheses in place of all of your x's. And then put the entire thing you're supposed to substitute for x right in there in the parentheses so that you don't make any mistakes. Now it comes down to the order of operations. What should I do first per our agreement? Exponent. Exponent, there's an exponent, so let's do that. Two is the exponent, means multiply something by itself twice. Negative two, very clearly that thing, then I'm supposed to multiply by itself twice. So like that, besides the little word. Like here we have this negative here, that means we're, it's like this and this are like plus or minus, like they're on the plus minus level, they're never going to cross over and be multiplication, right? We are adding, subtracting here, right? Don't change it. All right, move on. so should I subtract nine from four? Because order of, order of operations, we agreed, would be multiplication before addition subtraction, right? So we're multiplying here. Should I do negative two divided by six? Not if you're going left to right. Not if you're going left to right, which we agreed to do. Uh, so negative 9 times negative 2, that gives us an 18 for, remember I said, that whatever results here, we take the 4 and we are adding. Right? If it came out to be negative, that would be subtraction. That would be subtraction. It's got to be positive. Right. Add 4 plus 18. No, of course not, because we agreed to do division before addition so that we could get rid of all those parentheses. Right? So we don't have to write this. It's just implied. Four plus three, seven. Here's something I would like you to notice. Let's say we came right here, actually here, right here, four, all right? And now I'm trying to decide what to do next. I'm gonna take negative two divided by six. What do you think will happen? I'm gonna do negative two divided by six first. That's clearly out of order, right? I'm supposed to go left to right. <coughs> it'll work though. Is it going to work? Yeah. Why? Because um, even though you're supposed to go left or right, I bet it's not like required. Right. If we understand the operations and how numbers interact, then we can do things in slightly different order as long as we understand what's going on here. So let's just try it out, see if I'm right. So we still got the minus 9. Now I'm going to multiply this by the result of negative 2, time, uh, negative two divided by 6. Right? Negative 2 divided by 6 is negative 1 third. Write it like that. Okay. Now I have four. Well, I'm in the plus here, right? Negative times negative is positive. And we get what is nine times three? Or nine times one third. Nine over three. So this applies to three. Seven. Right? Comes out the same. And it's not a coincidence. Right. Now we can't go wrong if we stick to the order that we agreed to. We go left to right, we'll get it right. But also, it could also be read this other way. And here's why, because really you can think of it as coming down to how do we multiply fractions straight across, right? Correct? Okay. So, let's see. Whether I look at it like this as basically negative 9 times negative 2 over 6 or negative 2 squared uh, so I should say a plus right there, or uh, minus nine times uh, negative two over six. This, if I write it this way, this is the order that we agreed to, right? This forces me to do the multiplication first and then to divide. Okay. But if I write it this way, it's the same thing because you know what this is? This is negative nine over one, and if I multiply these two numbers together, what do I do? I multiply the numerators together. It's the same. Whether I take this first and then multiply by negative nine, or multiply by negative, like multiply the fractions together first, is essentially what's going on. So 
it's like Colin said, it's, it is an agreed upon order. It will produce a standard answer. But it's, it's good to ask those questions. What if I do divide by six, do, divide negative two by six first? Will it matter? No, it won't matter because we have this multiplication and we multiply the numerators together. It's a different story if the division comes first and then the multiplication, then it does matter. Then it does matter. Just something to think about. If you just want to follow the standard order of operations, never ask any questions, you'll be fine. But just something to think about. Okay, simplify, we're going to distribute. We get 2x plus 4. Remember, this between this group of stuff and this group of stuff, we have addition. It's on that level, oh. on that level of like PEMDAS. It's at the addition subtraction level between those two groups. So we're going to add whatever comes out. Right? We're going to distribute. What are we going to distribute into the parentheses? Negative 4x, right? Not 4x. And even if you say to yourself, I'm going to distribute negative 4x, sometimes you wind up forgetting about that negative, particularly when it goes to the second term. So be careful. You get a negative 4x squared, and then negative 4x times negative 3 is a positive 12x. So the negative 4x squared, we have uh, two terms that are x terms, so we've got a total of 14x, and then uh, the only constant there is. And remember, if somebody has 14x minus 4x squared plus 4, that's the same thing. It's not any different. It would produce all of the same numbers. Whatever you plugged in for x, it would produce all the same numbers. So order's not important here because we're just adding it all together. Uh, okay. That is all. Are there any questions? If there's not, then score it. Right? Score the whole thing. And pass it back to the person who it came from. The person who it came from, look at it. See what mistakes you might have made. Make some helpful notes so that if you were to study this later, it would actually be helpful. And then pass it in once you're ready. So what I want to focus on today is a, it's a really simple, basic connection um, between what I'll call equation style functions and graph style functions. You'll notice I said functions for both of those because of these equations and these graphs and tables and order pairs and all sorts of different things are all just functions. There are different ways of representing functions. A graph is a picture way of representing a function. An equation is a kind of a set of instructions way of representing a function. What, now I'm going to ask you, is a function? What does a function do? I didn't know. That was in the Something goes in, something comes out. I don't know if we can say it with fewer words than that. Like, something goes in, something comes out. Maybe fewer words and more symbols, or you just put input slash output. Something goes in, something comes out. Very, very basic. So in math, we're, we're familiar with functions. We'll look at some functions. We'll work with functions today. Uh, there are some functions we can spot that, that fit a mathematical definition of a function, such as uh, the vending machine. Oh, yeah. Money the vending machine, do they have function? In, in out. chips out. Veggie chips out. After yeah. what goes yeah. out. Instead of M&M's, yeah. Right? The input is kind of twofold, where well, there's two parts to it. The correct amount of money and the beer snack. Beer food, right? <laughs> you gotta get the you gotta put the snack numbers. So you gotta have the right amount of money, you gotta put the beep poops in Couple so that they are the correct beep poops and then it gives you what you want. Okay. Um, what other real world things fit the mathematical definition of a function? Like uh, ATM. ATM. So you gotta put your card in, you gotta put your ID, you gotta tell how much you want, you have to have that much, and then you get it out, right? But some, some, beep poops. some amounts of <laughs> some beep poops. But I was Don't skip numbers. that step. Yeah, correct. A gas pump. A gas pump, oh. right? You input your card and out comes gas, right? Very simple thing. Uh, and also you can think of input as like the time that you hold the trigger. Hold the, trigger. Yeah. the amount of time that you hold the trigger, is, that's the input and the output would be a certain amount of gas, right? And the gas comes out at a certain rate, you know, gallons per second, gallons per minute, and depending on how long you hold that, there's your input, there's your output, right? Yeah. For a 
product driving. You like press the gas pedal and like you go faster. Pedular? Pedular? What's a pedular? He's just, he's just trying to ride my big boobs coattails. Oh. Um, so yeah, I guess a more kind of ethereal and energy and conceptual way, yes. Like the time spent holding the pedular at a certain uh, distance for a certain amount of time. Yeah, it gives you a certain For real? Yeah, it's real. real. Oh, for real. Yes, yeah, for real. <laughs> for right real. here. It's it's copy it's with. So gross. I have a hard, solid, massive, gross stuff. And then <laughs> yeah. click if you want a thick, regular, or regular. slurpy. <laughs> <laughs> then you click the buttons, and then you weigh a little bit, and then you got a right. nice smoothie. Input a kind of ice cream, and a thickness, and out comes that kind of ice cream at that thickness, yeah. What you eat, and then what you have. <laughs> the human body is an input-output function machine, yes? Like a fire, you put the wood in and you get heat. Okay, yeah, and you put in, uh, even if, like fire in general, you can put in wood or you can put in uh, you know, magnesium, you can put yeah. in copper, you can put in different things, you can give you different colors, that's how you fire works, right? So yeah, all of these things are good examples of functions. You put something in and you get something out, it's predictable, there's a rule for it, right? Some of the rules are a little more complicated, like why certain colors come from certain Burning, right? There's a lot of chemistry that I don't understand. But it's there. There is an explanation. So in mathematics, a very simple function would be an equation. Right? An equation, uh, it tells you the roadmap for taking the things that go in and turning them into, into the things that come out. Okay? So let's do a simple one. Do something like y equals uh, 4 fifths x plus 2. Um, and all I want you to do is this is kind of like the homework that I gave you actually a few classes ago. Put in three things, and, and then figure out what three things come out with each of those things. And then what I want you to do is like, as I come around, make it easy for me to spot like what you put in and what you got out, all right? So keep track of it that way, so it's easy for me to spot and see, you know, can I spot any mistakes? Okay, so I'm just going to ask you to uh, throw out some inputs that you put in there that, that you chose. Two. 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 Okay, good. Two. <laughs> Two. Yeah. Next squad. Three. Three. Four. Seven. Seven. Eight. Eight. One. One. Five. Five. Eight. One Eight. jar. Eight. One. Ten. Eight. Ten. Nine. Ten. That's Nine. lower than Nine. two. Yeah. Zero. 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 Put some negative numbers. Any negative numbers up there? Negative one. Negative one. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's look at these inputs. Let's choose the easiest input. Five. Zero. zero. I would say five. Close behind zero. Zero is the easiest one, right? Because what's x doing is multiplying. Zero times anything is zero. So we're just left with two. Super easy. Say five would be the next easiest one. Okay, let's look at why. Or how come? Four fifths times five. The number five is going in for x. I'm going to write it as five over one because that's how we really need to think of it. Multiply by a fraction, so let's have two fractions multiply straight across. Maybe you say to yourself, hey, cross cancel. Five and five have a common factor of five. Or you can say, if I multiply by five, you know what I'll have? I'll have a number that's divisible by 5, which would be great, because if I could just divide this number by 5, then I don't have a fraction anymore. y equals, you can do it this way if you want, or you can just keep cross canceling 5, whatever you want. 4 plus 2, we got 6. Easy, right? Okay, so what would be the next simplest one, do you think? Yeah. 1? Let's do 1. Maybe, I don't know. y equals yeah. 4 fifths times 1 over 1. Plus two. Okay, so that's easy because that's just four fifths. Plus, we gotta do the common denominator, right? So two is how much in fifths? How many fifths? Ten, ten fifths. That wasn't too hard. It's fourteen fifths. Fourteen fifths. Anything even a little easier than one? Zero. It's zero. Oh. Right? It's zero. <laughs> ten complete. Yeah. Huh? Ten. Why ten? Five. 
the divisible by 5 as well, right? It's that denominator of 5 that makes us have a fraction. If we can cancel out that denominator of 5, we'll no longer have a fraction, and we don't have to really worry about it. So y equals 4 fifths times 10 over 1 uh, plus 2. Now if we cross cancel, 5 cancel with 10, and now instead of 5 canceling 5, we get 1 out of here, we get 2. Two, so we just multiply four by two. Or wait, eight. What am I talking to? And ten. Jeez. Okay. So now, if you're in charge of choosing inputs, which you are, are you going to choose two? You choose two. I did. Over another input. Is there an easier input than two? Five. Five was definitely so. Ten was easier. Zero was easier, but there's only one. Zero. There's nothing as easy as zero. If you were to choose another one, what would you choose? 15, 20, 20, 20 45, that are multi 30. Uh, multiples of 5. How about 15. negative numbers? How about negative 5? That wouldn't be that difficult. How about 100? 100, that's divisible by 5 as well, right? Now we're starting to, maybe, maybe you realize it, maybe you don't. We're starting to understand slope of a line just because we're trying to choose easy things to plug in for x. The easiest things to plug in are the things that are divisible by this denominator. Think about what we're doing. We're on the x-axis, right? We're choosing our input. We're choosing inputs that are in increments of five, horizontally, five, like the run, like rise over run, like we're moving over in groups of five every time. But never mind that. Doesn't matter right now. We're just doing the basics. How about negative five? What would I get here if I plug negative five in for x? What? If I plug negative five in for x? What do I get here? What's that? Four. Or negative 20 over five, 5, which simplifies down to? 4. Negative 4. Negative 4. Yeah. Got negative 4 plus 2. So 2. Oh, what are you doing? Negative, negative two. 2. All right, negative 2. Oh. Wow. Negative 2. All right, I have, no, I have <laughs> 5 input-output pairs. Here's what I want you to do. First, I want to point out, look, this is just this table here. It's just a way of keeping track of inputs and outputs. Right, that's it. Uh, there are lots of ways to do this. There are as many ways to do this as you can think of. If you can invent a new way that is different from this, I mean, just putting like a, an outline around this. Now it's kind of like spreadsheet style. It's very similar, but you know, it's slightly different. We could do ordered pairs. Right? I can go instead of. 5, and then on the other side, 6, I can just put in parentheses, 5 comma 6. Right? They go in order, x, y, alphabetical order, x and y. Uh, I, could, I could write a 5 here, and a 10 here, and a negative 5 here, uh, and a 0 here, put a 2 here, negative 2 here, a uh, 6, and a 10, and then I'll just draw arrows. So 0 goes to 2, and 5 goes to 6, and I guess negative 5 goes to negative 2. You know, there's another way of representing it. Kind of a crazy, space-wasting way to do it, but there's another way, all right? But the, the motivation behind a graph is that last thing I say, a space waster. We would like an efficient, small uh, way of representing all of these inputs and outputs. We can do that. A graph. A graph is a fairly efficient, compact way to keep track of all these inputs and outputs. Okay. In one space uh, with just some dots. Okay. So now, just to be sure that we don't think, do things like mix up the coordinates or forget about that there are negatives and things like that, I would like you to, for these really simple ones, just go ahead and plot those four points. Just plot those four points. Just plot those four points. Don't do anything but plot those four points. All right, so just a quick rundown of, a, of the xy plane, the Cartesian coordinate plane, named after uh, uh, Descartes. Descartes, the Cartesian coordinate plane. Uh, we've got positive direction, negative direction, right? This is horizontal. This is where we'll track our inputs. Input values go along the horizontal. Our outputs go along the vertical. Makes sense positive, that's negative. Only makes sense right, positive, left, negative, down, negative, up, positive. All right. So 
Five comes six, say uh, one, two, three, four, five is my input. One, two, three, four, five, six is my output. That, just that point in space on the Cartesian coordinate plane represents a unique pair of input output. Put this in and I get this out, it's unique. There's only that place represents five goes in and six comes out. Anywhere else would represent something else. Okay. Um, 10, 10. So 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 7, 8, 9, 10. Again, that point right there uniquely represents 10 goes in and 10 comes out. 0, 2. Now there's a, you know, 0 went in and 2 came out. And negative 5. Negative 2. There. Let's pretend I have no idea what the line, or, or sorry, what the uh, graph of this function should look like. Okay. This is the function. This is one way to represent the function. This is another way to represent the function. Okay. Pretend. I have no idea what the graph is supposed to look like. All right. Now I've gra graphed four points. Are you starting to feel like you would have a good guess as to what the graph should look like? What do you think it should look like? It looks like a straight line. It doesn't look curved at all, right? You know, if we're, if we're talking probability, what's, what's the likelihood that I would plot four fairly random points, and they're all in a straight line, but the actual graph is this crazy curvy thing? It's, it's possible, pretending I don't know anything about this function, really. It's possible, like, this point, okay, I just have to include these points, so what if the graph goes like this? It could be, but it seems really unlikely, right? Are you saying like there's like points at the peaks and stuff like that too? Well, that confused me. I don't know. What I'm saying is, what I'm trying to get you to see is a graph is not simply just some points and then a shape. And that shape is actually made of a bunch of what? However, you want to like display your data. It doesn't like have to like be a certain way. Well, the difference between this graph and like a data graph is the data, they could be correlated, they could be related to each other, but um, you know, that stuff doesn't typically make a perfect kind of shape. Like it looks kind of like a line. This thing should be a perfect line. Right? These kinds of functions will produce graphs that are perfect lines. The thing that I want you to understand is that when we go to graph something, it's, it's not just that the graph is, two points and a line. It's that drawing the line part that I want to have you view differently. Okay? That, let me ask you a question. Um, what if we did, we did plug in one, right? Plugged in one, we got 14 fifths. Let's say I, let's say I did draw this one. Okay, then I did go to draw the point one comma fourteen fifths. Where would that land? Uh, almost one, three. One and two and four fifths. Yeah. So How about in relation to the line that I've drawn? Where would it land? On it or not on it? On it, but barely. Well, should be on it. Yeah. Okay. Here's what I want you to understand. If you go about graphing more and more and more points, let's say I graph a thousand points, what would those thousand points start to look like? A line, that line that I just drew, right? If the graph of this function indeed is a line, which we, we may happen to know that it is. The, the graph is not a line, a graph is a collection of all of the infinite number of points representing inputs and outputs. Does that make sense? If I did, did billions of inputs and got all the billions of outputs and graphed all of those billions of inputs and outputs yeah. that would fit like on this screen, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about going out to a billion, I mean even incrementally in between zero and five. All those billions of points would start to mush together and squish together and get so close together that I couldn't even distinguish spaces between them, and then they would start to look like what? A oh, solid line. line. That solid line that I just drew up there, right? Wow. That's what a graph is, okay? It makes sense, though. Like, 
<laughs> so I want to break you out of the mindset that a graph is a, that, that a function like this, an equation style function, has a graph associated with it that is just the shape it's supposed to be because of I don't know, something that I've memorized and I've remembered correctly. If you know nothing about a function's graph, if you don't know anything about it, you have no idea what it's supposed to look like. Can you start to get an idea of what it's supposed to look like? How? How do you get an idea of what the graph is supposed to look like, even if you have no idea what it's supposed to look like? Plot. Plot more points. Plot points, plot points, plot points, plot points. We plotted four. Pretty confident that any more points that we plot are just going to land on the line that we could connect between those four points, right? Once you start to feel pretty confident that your graph looks like whatever it looks like it's starting to take shape, that's when you just say, I don't want a graph building with the points, so I'm going to draw this shape, the shape being my guess of where all of the buildings of points would be. Right. So is it supposed to be a straight line? All this, functions? In this case, no, not all functions. Okay. In fact, if we were to break it into like percentages, a very small percent of, of all graphs functions come out to be straight lines. That's a good question. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, absolutely not. Not all graphs are straight lines. In fact, so many more graphs are not straight lines than graphs that are straight lines. So you can get a triangle out of a function? Now that's a good question too. Now that gets to the second part of what makes a function a function that, we're in, that I don't want to bother with you, bother you with right now. Right? The input output is the most important thing. <coughs> okay. The problem with a triangle. This is such a good question to have. Me explore. They can just automatically. Here's the problem with it. Imagine that there's some equation that gives me this graph. Now I don't. I'm not expecting you to write it down, figure out what it is at all. But let's look at what this what this equation would have to do. Okay. It would be y equals some stuff, right? Yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah. All right, I don't know what it looks like. It could be some crazy looking thing. But here's what would happen. Let's say that this, this is the x uh, of two. Now remember what a graph is. It's not, you don't just draw lines. That's not the graph. The, the, I mean, you do draw lines, but those lines are the mushed together billions and trillions of points that we don't want to bother take the time to graph, oh. right? So, when I go to two, right, that means that I've put two into this function. Are we all cool on that? Does that make sense? Put two into that thing and just imagine that it's possible for this equation to exist and I put two into it. All right, so let's come over to the graph. Let's see what happens. When I did all the stuff that I do with this equation, what did I get out? Well, when I put in, remember, when I talk about putting in one thing, like putting in negative five, putting in zero, putting in five, putting in 10, I just get out one output. And that input output is represented by a single point, okay? So when I put in specifically two, what does it look like I got out? <laughs> yes. You should get a point, right? That point represents what you get out. Pardon? You should get like a positive two and a negative four. Okay, so that's your guess as to, so you're saying there looks like the point that's associated with x is 2, and there looks like another point that's associated with x is 2, and so it looks like 2 and, that's the important part, negative 4. 2 and negative 4. Can you think of anything that you can plug in a number and get out two numbers? Yeah, multiply the and by and, and. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you make it up. Make it up. This is a very difficult thing to do. If you just throw together things that you know, basically put together any long string of like complicated uh, order of operations challenge. Like imagine you're putting together an order of operations challenge. You put together exponents, parentheses, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, maybe square roots, maybe sine and cosine. Put anything you want in there. Okay? But you know what happens? 
you do all of that computation, you know what you come out with? A number. A, a single number. Two numbers? When I square two, do I get two different numbers? No. no I just get four. And when I take that four and I add seven, do I get two different numbers? No, I get 11. You see what I'm saying? Through a process of mathematical operations, how are you going to come up with two different numbers? If you have some like which divided by 2 equals x minus 4 equals y, then you can get two different numbers. Ah. <laughs> Kelly. Okay. Keeping this, uh, you, you got a good point there. What? But what keeping it simple, meaning that I have, this is y, this will be my output, and the only thing over here is one letter. Make it x, make it h, it doesn't matter, but only one. You can use it lots of different times, but only one letter. Only just x, right? You only replace one thing, like just x, or just h, right? not h and x. And that, that causes issues. But you have a valid point, yeah. But if there's just one, no, one letter to replace with two, that you're only ever going to come out with one result, right? If you follow the order of operations that we all agreed on, we'll come out with, boom, 15. We'll come out with negative 37. But you're not going to go through the order of operation and come out with 2 and also at the same time negative 4 as the end result. Yeah? Did like ancient mathematicians used to do all the points and then just adapted to drawing the line? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, just because that like sucks. Because <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> the fact that you can look at that and say that would suck is like, it shows you get it. Getting what I'm trying yeah, to get like across. the billions of points. Or right. Whatever. At some point, we kind of have to just say, you know what? If I were to keep doing this forever, I would die doing this for one thing. <laughs> but also, I would just wind up making whatever this sh this thing starts to look like. It's looking like this shape. Yeah. This is the shape that it's going to make. I may not draw this graph perfectly, but I'm going to go ahead and just connect the points into this curve that it definitely looks like. If I draw, if I start plotting tons and tons and tons of points and they're just so close together, right? They keep plotting them and they keep plotting them and they just keep looking like this. It's getting old. I'm just gonna go ahead and say, any points that I could plot are just gonna land on, on this shape, right? Any point that I plot will be a set of all, in this set of points. Yes? So I figured out how on the last one you could do it without problems. You just have n, and I figured out how to make it fit those boundaries and get you those two numbers. n equals y1 minus 6 equals y2. But that's two different things. Just because I call it y1 and y2, I can replace y1 with x and y2 with f. Right? They're two different things. See what I'm saying? Yeah. You gotta have, you gotta have one input and one output. Okay? So, the question being, could you wind up with a triangle? No, you're not going to wind up with a triangle with a simple function. Now, can I mess around and, and get it like, say, a calculator to draw a triangle on the graph? Yeah, I could. I could use three separate functions and then tell it only use these x's in between here and here, and I don't really worry about that. It's a really good question. And that gets into what a function does. The function takes one thing in, and what does it get out? One thing. One thing in, one thing out, that is all. Every input has only one output. Yeah. So like the line can never intersect with another line? Well, if it did, it would mean that you have two separate functions just graphed so with one function. in the same Not with one function. Not with one function. Okay. Once, the, once, a, once a, a graph starts to like cross under itself or over itself, you see what you start to have? You have you start to have multiple outputs for one input. That's a violation of what a function is defined to be. Okay. Well, let's just um, I'm going to throw another function up here. Okay. And I want you to do the same thing. I want you to put in some stuff, get out some stuff, see if you can figure out what the graph looks like.
really confident I'm not going to make any mistakes, or very rarely will make mistakes. So I, I'm all right with me not doing more. If you are making mistakes, it means you need more practice. So you should definitely practice this by hand. Okay. It gives you the added bonus of, of practicing the order of operations. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're making sure we replace x correctly and all that. So let's just wrap these real quick. Kind of a rough sketch. Uh, let's see. I need to go as high as 20. All right. Two, three. Negative three, negative sixteen, negative two to zero. It's changing really fast. Negative one four. Let's say that's at uh, zero two one zero two four. Let's call that and three twenty. Let's call that twenty. Now, what you need to keep in mind is what is this graph going to do past the points that I'm. I'm bothering to plot in between the points I'm bothering to plot. Right. What do you think is going to happen between negative 2 and negative 1? Like, where do you think those points are going to fall? Between these two dots, right? Keep in mind, we are, we are grabbing this thing from left to right, right? Or from right to left, but what we're doing is trying to connect the dots between. Right? Where would these, I think if I were to put a negative, uh, two and a half, I'd probably get a point like right there. That's what I think. And if I were to put a negative two and three fourths, I think I'd get a point right about there. Right? Drawing and connecting with a curve is guessing at what the points will be. We're going, we're going, I think it's going to like this, I think it's going to hit that guy, go through there. This one, go through there, and just keep going. This was an accident. Whoa! That's a big Yeah. Seems like. If I keep putting in bigger numbers for x, I'll just keep getting bigger numbers out for y. It seems like that. What do we have? I have like a 900 something over here from somebody? Uh, 10? 10? Yeah. You put in 10, you got out like 900 something? Yeah, I got it. That certainly seems five. to support it, right? Nice. So that's what it seems like this graph will do, or this function will do. Get too big, put too, too big an x in there, it just gets unruly. Get out of here. Have a good day. Thank you. See ya. Bye.